Yeah, on Absence of Waldo, we generally like to do a lot of uh, highbrow yeah. music reviews. We're doing a bit of a modest mouse with respect. Uh huh. Well, I want to review a band who uh, subtlety isn't exactly their forte. No. Um, but that probably must, that's what makes them awesome. Okay. Um, I describe them as the Michael. Uh, sorry, not Michael. Bay. Michael Mann. <laughs> the James Cameron yeah. of a heavy metal world. And it is Iron Maiden's new album. The Book of Souls, which I finally received on vinyl the other day after Amazon messed up my order. Okay. Man and man, I love this band. Oh yeah. Iron Maiden are unashamed about the kind of music that they make, and somehow they've managed to remain relevant. Have they been going since the early 80s? Yeah. Yeah. And they still make, you know, you know like lots of bands from that period, you know, they're still together now, they're like granddads, they just keep churning out the same old song. And when the new album comes out, nobody cares. How do they compare to um, everyone's favourite metal band of that era, Metallica? Oh, Iron Maiden are way better. <laughs> oh, yeah. To say the least. Iron Maiden have something that not many, a lot of metal bands of their age have called integrity. Oh, yeah. And they're not afraid to challenge the fans. Yeah. They're not afraid to experiment. Like Anthrax. <laughs> like Anthrax. Um, now, I, I have a huge amount of respect for Iron Maiden. Um, okay. It's I, I describe them, I said, I describe them as the James Cameron of the... Heavy Battle Universe is that it's a big, huge summer blockbuster, but with smarts. Oh yeah. While something like Metallica is like what we said, like the um, Michael Bay, like the Michael Bay, or Luke Besson. <laughs> yeah, I'll say, but the Luke Besson is Metallica. Anyway, I'm gonna try and legitimize it because it's not worth it. Heavy Metal get. I'm just gonna say Heavy Metal gets snubbed by snooty uh, music fans. I think it's horribly unfair because. So, you know, you, you never disregard a genre of film because you think it's lesser. It's like saying science fiction films aren't worthy of study. <laughs> or, yeah, I, I think heavy metal and progressive rock get unfairly snubbed by snooty music critics because we see it as being below them. Fuck you, basically, yeah. is what I want to say. Oh, yeah. uh, because it, it's not fair. You wouldn't disregard a whole genre because you see it below, being below you. So I'm not going to stop even legitimising this review. Um, so, The Book of Souls is the 16th Iron Maiden album oh, yeah. um, in their nearly 40 year history. No, 30 year history, so I'm a massive shit. Yeah. Um, now, the great thing about Iron Maiden is that, um, well, throughout the 80s, I'll, I'll do a little bit of context. Throughout the 80s, they were one of the most beloved metal bands of the era. Were they part of uh, the Big Four? No. Okay. No, they actually predate the Big Four. Oh, okay. Um, Iron Maiden were part of a movement called the uh, New Wave of British Heavy Metal, which combined the uh, the heavy rocking guitars of Deep Purple and Black Sabbath with more punk aesthetics. Okay. Um, you know, like the Clash of the Sex Pistols and bands like that. And Iron Maiden are kind of like a weird... Well, they started out as a weird love child between the two, with one foot in heavy metal and progressive rock and the other in punk. Yeah. Combined them together and be made by a Maiden. The, re the band really hits the stride when... Living legend Bruce Dickinson joins the band. Yeah. Um, who his operatic voice took him to new heights of creativity and artistic success. Um, basically, from the Number of a Beast, one of the best rock albums of all time, um, they charted an amazing group of albums which consistently met fan expectations while also challenged fan expectations. Uh, so, you got Number of a Beast, Peace of Mind. Uh, Power Slave, which is seen as being like their creative um, commercial peak. Yeah. Um, then they go into experimentation with more synthesized sounds of Somewhere in Time and Seventh Son of the Seventh Son, which are two brilliant albums. Bruce Dickinson leaves, but well, well, one of the main driving forces of a band leaves, Adrian Smith, who is the guitarist, and they go for a more kind of gritty, um, earthy sound, which isn't good. I made no more about the operatics. Um, and the Bruce Dickinson soon, soon leaves, and they're replaced by a chap called Blaze Bailey, okay. who nobody likes. No. Um, but then Adrian Smith and Bruce Dickinson return to the band just before the turn of the century, um, with the brilliant album Brave New World. And pretty much since then, they've consistently charted album after album that's been probably better than the last. Yeah. Um, and the best thing about them is that, as mentioned earlier, they've remained to their artistic integrity by consistently challenging their audience. Well, for example, like on one tour, they didn't play any classic songs, they just played all songs from their latest albums. 
Oh, yeah. They didn't play any old ones, which frustrated a lot of old, fat, middle-aged men who just wanted to go see and listen to the classics, right? Uh, one tour, all they did was they just played the new album. Yeah. That was it. So I have a lot of respect for a band like that. Yeah. It would be so easy for them to just to go out and make Number of the Beast 2. Yeah. And satisfy all their old fans. But then they'd become as culturally irrelevant as bands like Kiss uh, or Judas Priest or stuff like that. Um, and Def Leppard's still going. Yes. Very another good example. Yeah. Um, basically, none of the new wave of British heavy metal bands are relevant these days except for Iron Maiden. Um, yeah. Because they're consistently challenging and each album is always something new and exciting to look forward to. Um, and the Book of Souls... Yeah. It's no goddamn different. Um, so it's the longest gap between the Nine Maiden album. The last one was in 2010 with The Final Frontier, yeah. which was fucking awesome. Um, I heard that you saw the band live around this period. I did, I did. I went to go see the Iron Maiden live uh, on The Final Frontier tour, my first ever live concert. Oh, yes. By an actual band, not tribute band. Uh, and they were amazing. Not the Wiggles. Not the Wiggles. No, no. Yeah. no. And they're amazing, you know, they have such a command of the audience. And you can tell that they're a band that appeal to all ages. Which is quite rare you have a band like that. You yeah. had really old people there, who you could tell were from like, you know, the, the early 80s, there from the beginning. Yeah. But we also had like, you know, like, eight year olds there, <laughs> who were just really into the band. You had people at like my age there, and they appeal to all generations, just because they make good music. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so this is the longest gap between an Iron Maiden album. Is it the longest album? Yes, it's a 90 minute epic. Oh yeah. Um, and this one's got some added significance to it because um, in between finishing recording of the album had been released, Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer, uh, was diagnosed with uh, tongue cancer. Okay. Um, and it was a very you know, kind of you know close call with death kind of thing. Um, and he's, he's come through, he survived it, he's beaten it, but this one just adds an extra bit of oomph to it because, you know, there was a chance that this could have been the last one. Yeah. Um, Bruce Dickinson, by the way, is a living legend. Okay. Um, he's a amazing singer. Yeah. Um, he also owns his own brewery factory and they make Iron Maiden beer, which is really good. Awesome. It's a good, it's a good beer. He's also... What does it taste like? Hmm? What does it taste like? Like metal. Like metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's also um, an aviation pilot. Oh, right. Uh, he actually flies the band around the world in their jumbo <laughs> jet, you know. Instead of going on a tour bus, I made him fly there. Okay. Um, during the whole, like, there was some really bad hurricanes on the East Coast a few years back, and most pilots refused to fly to the East Coast, to, you know, to bring people out and bring them to safety. Bruce Dickinson was one of the only ones that went oh, that's awesome. to go save the day. Yeah. He's just an awesome guy. Uh, and he's also the lead singer of one of the best heavy metal bands of all time, which helps. Um... So, the Book of Souls is highly anticipated amongst fans. Yeah. Uh, people have been looking forward to this one for a hell of a long time. And just listening to it makes the five year wait worth it. I just want to show off my vinyl, by the way. It's a tri triple vinyl. And it's just a thing of beauty. Look, look at that. Look, look at that. Just awesome. It is. Um, vinyl really is pretty cool. Vinyl is cool. Yes. Um, so... Right then, where, where do we begin? Right, what what uh, what kind of sound is this? What kind of era of Iron Maiden does it sound like? Any of the other ones? Or is it 2015. Just now? 2015. It sounds like Iron Maiden in 2015. Yeah. Um, but what's great about these songs is that um, they kind of do a few little like music cues, which are from like the older albums, as like a little nod of a head. Yeah. But this is very much Iron Maiden 2015. Um, since the release of Brave New World, they've definitely got a lot more um, uh, proggy. Okay. Um, but in an Iron Maiden kind of way. Yeah. Um, which I, you know, I love. It's great. You know, they've always suited those huge operatic sounds. Um, and when Iron Maiden basically stopped being a punk-influenced band, is when they got good, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, there are some sad fans who still long for the days that Paul Diano returns. <laughs> Paul Diano. He's the original lead singer. Type in Paul Diano into Google. Oh yeah. And look at him now. <laughs> he's a mess. He's a mess. All right. He's a he's a horrible bitter man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So uh, the, the, the Book of Souls very much sounds like Iron Maiden um, in 2015. And wanting to challenge their audiences as much as possible. Yeah. Because why rest on your laurels? Exactly. 
This is this is what music's all about. Well, that's the thing. They're never going to need money or anything again. They might well, exactly, as well just challenge yeah. them as much as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They've sold eighty-five million records in the time. Yeah. Why not do a you know a whole bunch of really challenging albums for the fans? Yeah. Look. And in terms of length, this is the longest one. This is a ninety-minute album. How many songs are there actually? Like eleven. How many? Eleven. Eleven songs. So you look at an average of about eight minutes. Yeah. 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 Now, um, I've only listened to the album twice. Yeah. I listened to it last night on vinyl. Basically, I, I just I got this from the locker, ran home and just put it on, blast it all night. Yeah. Um, and then as I've been walking about doing my business today, I listened to the whole album. Okay. Um, so it's split over. If you're gonna have a vinyl, by the way, it's split over three discs, three <laughs> yeah. vinyl discs. is about two songs per side. Yeah. Um, so the album opens up with uh, it, "If Eternity Should Fail," which is a. Um, it starts with like this really cool, like slow synthesized. Um, kind of score and it's got Bruce Dickinson singing these kind of weird lyrics about Mayan rituals um, and it's really cool and atmospheric and it's unexpected um, and then it launches into the main riff which then develops into that kind of classical uh, Iron Maiden gallop which yeah. is what we're really famous for um, and somehow we managed to make lyrics which is all about Mayan rituals like which sounds fucking ridiculous and stupid on paper. Well, it's like a Spinal Tap concept. It is, it is, yeah. Yeah. But somehow they're able to, like, I don't know how they do it, but somehow they're able to completely transcend all the Spinal Tap-isms. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how they do it. I think it's just done with such gusto and love. Yeah. That, like, you kind of just have to go along with it. <laughs> is it winking the is it, is it knowing, or...? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Because that tends to be the difference, like, um... Well, like, Iron Maiden are a little bit like Rush. <laughs> yeah. Where, like, Rush are, like, um really self-deprecating yeah uh, they know they're ridiculous and they kind of love I kind of love them because of that yeah I think Iron Maiden are the same I mean, they are, but there's no pretension to Iron Maiden no. you know they're just like six blokes who love heavy metal music and just want to you know tour the world and play music to the fans yeah that's all they want to do at the end of the day while also you know remaining artistically credible yeah um, they're just normal people at the end of the day there's no they, yeah, they, there's no L. Ron St. Hubbard in the band or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we managed to make this ridiculous concept about Mayan rituals and rebirth and all that kind of stuff and make it just fun. Yeah. Um, this is then followed by Speed of Light, which is the single from the album, which is about a fit. oh, if Turkey Chevelle is about eight minutes. Okay. Uh, it builds up to this brilliant crescendo. Uh, Speed of Light is the single from the album. It's actually from the two listens. It's my least favorite. Okay. Um, it's a it's a decent song. Is it a lot shorter than the others? Yeah, it's it's a five minutes. Okay. Um, this one is very much in the realm of kind of eighties Iron Maiden. Um, in fact, you know, it's got a huge riff. It's even got a cowbell, which made me chuckle. Um, I, I, I kind of like that element. Yeah. Um, and again, kind of what sells it is just the gusto of the performances. Yeah. Um, and how much Bruce Dickinson throws himself into it. But compared to some of the other tracks on the album, which are really heady and quite dense. And ambitious. And ambitious. It's a little bit lightweight. Yeah. Uh, I still like it. Uh, I mean, it may grow on repeated listens. Um, the next two tracks are The Great Unknown and The Red and The Black. Yeah. The Great Unknown, I don't remember too much. I don't remember <laughs> liking it. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit slow, if I remember correctly. But The Red and The Black is where it's at. That's like a 30 minute song. Yeah. Um, it's all about like. Um, Betrayal for our history. Oh, yeah. Like how people have been fucked over. Yeah. And all the different figures of betrayal, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty awesome. It, it goes on a little bit too long. Yeah. Um, there's a massive instrumental which goes on for like five, seven minutes, but again, it's done with such love for what they're doing, I kind of can't help but give it a, a bit of a pass. Yeah. Um, 